Well, thank you very much for joining us for another edition of In Camp with Isaac Dugwe as we build up to April 1 uh, as the Ghanaian boxer and the Ghanaian former world champion uh, makes a very big attempt to get back to world championship status, to write a different story and a different script and give himself a new accolade which will set him apart from many boxers who have grazed terrains here and in different parts of the world. We've been having conversations uh, here in Washington, D.C. with people who are close to Isaac Dewey's camp and who contribute in a very big way to what he does on a daily basis. Today, we're taking it to a very high point in the sense that the man who uh, saw the vision in putting together uh, a place like this where many young people will come to uh, you know, achieve their dreams and also has been in charge of Isaac's charge in the ring is here with us. My guest today for this special edition of In Camp with Isaac Dugby is the main man himself, the head trainer of the um, Bald Eagle Boxing Center here in Washington, D.C., uh, the man, Barry Hunter. Coach, good to have you. Man, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, great, especially great, great. coming all this way. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's always worth it. And uh, thank you so much for the warm reception as well. I yeah, really appreciate it. Cool, man. I appreciate the love. Great, 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 great. Um, you know, I, I walk in here and I see, uh, you know, a lot of work, um, you know, when you look at these walls, I mean, spiritually, they tell you a lot of things, considering the fact that you've had, you know, minimum of about 10 world champions pass through here, um, you know, you reflect now and, and you're looking at the starting stages. Um, how, how fulfilled do you feel considering that you, you, you had the vision and you decided to put this place together and you've worked with this amazing number of young people and young boxers. Well, first of all, you know, I gotta give God all the praise, you know what I mean? Because without the most high, I couldn't have done none of this, you know what I mean? Uh, second, um, you know, I have uh, a young fella, he ain't as young as he was, that, you know, worked alongside of me that I used to be his coach as well, you know what I mean? My right hand, you know, and, uh, and Boogie Patrice Harris or shall I say Patrice Boogie Harris. Yeah, Boogie. <laughs> you know I mean? One of the most loyal cats that I ever had a chance to, you know, not only help raise in the sport and in life, but, you know, one of the ones that actually truly came back and made the same sacrifices that I made, you know. So, you know, you know that, I got to give my wife credit for the fact that, you know, times that I had to leave, you know, my house for, you know, weeks and sometimes months at a time. You know, my kids as well. You know, all of these people, you know, had something to do with, you know, what I've done thus far in this boxing game. And to answer your question, as far as being uh, filled or full, uh, it's still, you know, some hunger there, some things that I want to do that I want to finish. Now, you know, uh, we, we've been through the titles. We've been through the titles both in the amateur and the pro, both male and female. Now I'm chasing history. That's what I want. Great, great. And uh, the bit to chase history, how tough do you think it's going to be? I mean, considering the fact that you've seen different levels of, of toughness, you know, in this boxing terrain. Oh, it's definitely going to nothing <laughs> really in this world worth having, you know, it's going to be easy. You're going to have to grind, you're going to have to work for it. And, um, you know, when you, you know, talking about trying to put your name alongside of a lot of the legendary coaches that came before me. You know, it's going to take some work, you know. You, I had the pleasure of uh, sitting down and meeting people like Angelo Dundee, wow. Mr. George Washington out of New York, one who I considered to be a mentor to me, uh, which was Emmanuel Stewart, which I, I tell people a lot of times, just I had this conversation today, which I think may have been arguably the greatest trainer of all time. When you look at his stable and who he had and how many yeah, world champions who he, he produced, had, yeah. who he produced, you know, yeah. so, you know, anytime you're trying to walk in them type of footsteps, and let me get uh, DC trainer some love. When you think about people like uh, Adrian Davis on round one, you think about Ham Johnson, uh, which, which is, is, which is DC, Mr. Dave Jacobs, uh, Mr. McCain's. You think about some of these people that came through uh, DC coaching. 
uh, God rest his soul, Gary Russell, uh, the father of uh, Gary Russell Jr., which is world champ. If you think about these people, you know, these were legendary figures in D.C., you know, yeah. coaching. So, you know, when you start walking these walks alongside of these people, it's a lot of, lot of, lot of legend, man. You know what I mean? Well, Emmanuel Stewart, I mean, this, this name is, 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 is heavy and is imprinted on, on our hearts and is imprinted on, on the sport because of his achievements, like you said. Um, tell me the one thing that you learned from him in coming across him that has guided your career as a boxing trainer up to this point. I remember uh, when, we, when we won, I think, maybe our first world title yeah. years ago. So yeah. I got a call. I was getting calls from everybody. I mean, Don King, uh, Bob Arum, just everybody. Um, and Manny called, you know, and I used to look at, like I said, his stable. You know, and you think of the names that he had, and a lot of them that he raised from scratch to become world champion is just outstanding. And uh, he was telling me about, uh, and I had to face him in a corner at least twice in my career. And he was think he was telling me about uh, the talent in DC, you know, and how there was a lot of talent here. He said, but one of the things that, you know, hinder us from going even further is, is it was a lot of hate going on. I see. This is what man he said. And uh, he said, but if, if you could eliminate that, you know, talent is, you know, you, you, you cannot dispute the talent that come out of, comes out of D.C. He actually had some fighters that came from here as well. But the main focus was just to stay focused. And funny story, uh, we were in the gym one day. Uh, this was shortly before he passed away. He gave me a phone call, and he had a fighter at the time, which was Adonis Stevens. Then he needed some sparring for him. So he called us, we had a kid that he knew, and uh, we talked about it, we laughed, and he said to me, he said, look, he said, um, he said um, I done done everything in boxing. He said, but, and I know you guys down there doing your own promotions. He said, and, and I think that's something I'm gonna get into. He said, uh, maybe we can do something together. He said, but I have to go to Atlanta first for a procedure. And I asked him, I said, you all right? He said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, a little procedure. He said, you know, when I come back, we sit down and we talk about it. That was the last time I spoke to him. He never made wow. it back. Right? Wow. And so the next phone call I got was from a friend and an associate of him, Mr. Prentice. Gave me a call and told me what had happened. Yeah. Wow. Hello, I'm Isaac Williams from Dudbe. And I'm excited to be at the Nice Cocoa Plant Industries. Come on, let's take a look. My visit here was exceptional. Um, getting a tour, visiting Niche, one of the largest private cocoa processing companies in the whole of West Africa. It was worth to learn about how the product was being produced and how it's handled from the factory and then to the consumer. Because I, I believe that this product is really gonna make a difference. Strength is essential. Nutrition is essential. You know, that's the reason why we working with Niche um, Cocoa Industries is very very important what well, the setup was amazing i looked at it and i'm like oh wow you know i've never really witnessed anything that of such magnitude here in ghana before ideally you might think that these things only happens in abroad but coming here um i saw a lot of things that i wasn't expecting to see by the questions that we're that we're asking and the line manager taking us through about the safety aspects how the things are produced and no human contact until everything is done and it's being picked up from the belt to where it has to be clean from um, like as a whole package you know it was, it was pretty amazing i think that you know it's like it's a new um, dispensation niche cocoa industries is now in the in the in the heavyweights of um, companies in, in in west africa if not in the world Wow. 
Well, if you just joined us, we're here on In Camp with Isaac Dogbe, this very special edition with his head trainer, Barry Hunter, a man who has seen different curves and different uh, valleys and mountains in the sport of boxing and has also worked with quite a big number of world champions and is still on a mission to, as he says, make history and also imprint his name on the sands of the sport of boxing. Uh, we're having a conversation about his career, the beginnings and uh, you know how the journey shaped up. And we're also going to have a conversation about you know his uh, you know, contact with Isaac Dobie, working with him, what he's impacted, uh, you know, on his career so far, and the big task ahead. Uh, Coach, you, 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 you formed, you know, this big accolade, which has, you know, shaped the journey and the way you train and the way everybody uh, shapes their minds when they walk in here. And it's called the Headbangers. Everybody who's here is known as a Headbanger. Tell me about that concept of, of uh, the Headbangers. There was, uh, years ago, uh, we had, we went through various different names and different uniforms, different colors and, you know, what have you. And it started, you know, the first real headbanger that I had, you know, it started with a kid named Marvin Lee on the south side of D.C. And then, you know, of course, I had walked away for a while from the sport for years. Then I ended up at this place called Lincoln. It was, a high, it was a high school or middle school, junior high school, I, I can't remember. But it was Lincoln, and the gym was in the bowels of Lincoln. My nephew's dad had a job up there. I just so happened to be driving from work one day, and I saw a boxing ring on the, on the basketball court outside. And uh, later on that night, I had a conversation with my nephew's dad, which is, you know, a world-class referee by the name of Mr. Malik Wali. Uh, Told me he had got a job up there, you know, and I said, hey, you know, that's my thing, you know. He said, come on, I got you. So I went up there. But when I got there, there was a little room, maybe the width of it was smaller than this ring, and it wasn't as long as this ring, maybe a little bit. And there was no order. It was a mat on the floor. There was containers, you know, uh, big containers on the floor. I don't know what was in them. All I know is it stained the floor. Uh, kids was running in and out. I think we may have one or two bags in there and they hit the bag and run out. So it was no order. It was chaos. And um, I ended up grabbing a couple of the little kids and I started to work with them. Um, and from that point, there was a, a bigger kid, older kid by the name of Chris King. And, you know, he kind of gravitated towards me. I started working with him and uh, he turned from novice to an overclass fighter, and he just started winning. I see. He won like maybe 13 fights in a row. Straight up. Straight. Wow. And so we would come back with his trophy. He feel real good about himself, you know. And so Boogie, seeing him coming back and forth, seeing him coming back and forth, he's like, man, I got to get with this. This guy's winning. You know what I mean? And he asked me, would I help him out? And I, you know, kind of treaded lightly. Because, you know, they're kids, you know, these kids out in the streets, you know, you don't know, you know, how to approach them or what have you. And uh, so I told him, I said, when he reached out, that was the green light. I say, man, I say, no problem. I say, big man, you 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 are you're a lot faster than you know you are. You know, his hand, he had real quick hands to be his size. And, and so I started working with him. He was, you know, three plus at the time. You know what I mean? He got down to the low threes. You know what I mean? And then we started fighting. He started winning. And so I had them two, and they were doing their thing, right? And, uh, and then from them, you know, you had the rest of the kids coming in. And, and after a while, you know, the lead, it was born. You know what I mean? And so we ended up selling on the name. There was a, a song by, um, was it Method Man? It was, was it Method Man? Method Man, yeah. Yeah. Headbangers. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> I, I had a friend who was good in art. And kids, you know, I started training the kids and they started winning and they started stopping other kids. And I mean, it was like a wave, you know, nobody knew us. We just came out of nowhere. And um, he took, we liked the name Headbangers. So he took and cut it out in leather 
and, and printed it on one of the kids' shoes, and it stuck. And that has been the story. It's been a story. <laughs> and then the color purple. Mm. Of course, purple is, you know, has a, a good meaning behind it, you know, victory and royalty. You know what I mean? And so we did excellent in one of the tournaments. I mean, we blowing kids out. And the color stuck. So they started calling us the purple kids. And then when they put the name with the color, and the rest is history. Wow, interesting stuff there. <laughs> Look, um, you, you, you also, you know, look back at, at the, the achievements made um, producing all of these, these world champions. Can you, can you tell me about, you know, something common that runs across or a common trait that runs across some of the world champions that you've worked with over the period? Something well, common that runs, you know, you know, through their respective stories? Earlier on, when we, let's say when we got, most of the kids that I had, they all had a story, mm. you know, they were either in the shelters or, you know, in the streets, you know, running around with the drugs or, you know, uh, robbing, killing, stealing, you know, it was something, it was always that story. Um, juvenile delinquents, they were in the juvies, um, federal penitentiary, you know, I had it all. And those were the kids that I got. At the time, the kids that I, I got at the time were kids or young people that didn't nobody else want. The one society is say, you know, just, you know, leave them alone or cast them aside. Those are the ones that I ended up with, starting out. In fact, where we are right now, there used to be a shelter through those woods right there. And we used to get kids from the shelters too. And they all had that type of similar story for the most part. You may have one or two that had the parents with them. But the ones that didn't, those were the ones that we had, you know, at that time more success with. Wow. I don't know if it was their situation that made them more that hungrier, them. Yeah. you know, or, or made them appreciate more. I don't know. But those were the ones who, you know, a lot of time for the most part, until recent time, were the ones that were more successful. Well, interesting stuff. I, I've been following Isaac Dugway for, for a while now. Um, I got introduced to him when he was 14, and I saw him get drafted into Ghana's national team, went over to the Olympics, came back, took one fight after the other in the professional ranks, and then he started getting opportunities for titles. Long and short, he became a champion, and then he became an ex-champion, and then there was a crossroad. I remember having a conversation with his father, and his father said to me, you know, um, we're gonna switch things around, and I've made contact with, uh, you know, Barry Hunter and Patrice Harris, and they are, you know, he, uh, you know, Barry is a super, super trainer, superb trainer. And I trust that he's going to do a wonderful job. Um, tell me about your first encounter with Isaac, getting introduced to him and starting work with him and how it all went. It, it, it was wild. That was, that was from above. And I'll tell you why. So we first saw Isaac fight when he won a world title against Magdalena, mm. right? That was Saturday. I liked him. I liked his energy. I liked everything about him. The fact that he got dropped, got back up, ended up stopping Magdalena for it. I mean, it's classic. That's movie stuff. When I got to the gym that Monday, I was talking to Boogie. And I said to him, I said, man, you know, it was a kid that fought this weekend. Did you see that fight? You know, Isaac, we called him Dogbo. Dogbo, yeah. Because of the spelling of his name. Yeah. Right. And uh, I said, man, I love, you know, I would love to train him. You know what I mean? And so we laughed and talked and we liked how he fought, you know, the whole nine. And lo and behold, so we started watching him. And uh, when we were watching him, it was something different about after he won the title as opposed to winning the title. When he won the title, you could see the hunger. You know, you could see 
uh, the fact that I need this, I want this, that's what really got him up off that canvas, that and God. And he did his thing, he won the title. After he won the title, he didn't look the same to me, all right? He stopped another guy, and then he started deteriorating from there. And then the Mario and Navarati fight came. And I was like, boy, it's not the same kid we saw, you know what I mean? Something happened. Lost both fights. They contacted Boogie via Instagram. I, you know, I don't have social media. So I live through social media through them. Okay. And so Boogie told me that they had contacted them via social media. He was coming, he wanted to come down and said, bring him. Came down, when I came in the gym, he was right there on his bag over there. And I met him, you know, and he was super cool. Now, the plan was for him to come down here for a couple of weeks. And then, if I'm not mistaken, he's supposed to go to Denver after that. And we talked about it. We started working. He fell in love with us. We fell in love with him. The rest of history. That was a few years back. Now, he lives here. Um, but when he first came, the damage from that fight. Yeah. Now it's more psychological than it's physical. You know, the scars and the face healed and everything else. But you could see it left a psychological wound on him. We put him in here, started to spar, didn't have such a good time. You know, in fact, it was downright ugly for the, you know, the first few times that it went in. So Boogie and I was setting off to the side right here. And we started talking, you know, and we made a decision to pull him out of that situation, let him build his confidence, get the tears and all the bad feelings out your soul, and let's build a new. And that's what we did. So we took him off the grid for a while, you know, with the people that we in, because you, you, you come in here, you know, you may be a dog where you from, and that's cool, you bite. We got a lot of dogs in here. And so if you bite, bite they even bite harder. back. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and with that type of skill set, with that type of experience. Mm. And like you said, worldwide. We don't just have people here. We have people coming from all over the world working. And so once we got a grip on that, started building. Started building. And then you could see the confidence coming back. And then it got to the point where we couldn't put certain people in there with him. And, and then we had our first fight, and lo and behold, you know, you know he, he, he was exceptional. You know, you know, I thought it would be a little bit more hesitation, but he did better than we thought he, he would do his first fight. And then, of course, from that, you had uh, Adam Lopez, Christopher Diaz, Joette Gonzalez. We're here now. Great. Let's, let's talk a bit about the recovery process. Um, you know, I had conversations with him and, you know, he told me about, he told me exactly what you told me as well, uh, about being in a dark place and not being psychologically up there and not being psychologically strong. But we saw an Isaac who had come into the ring after this very trying period for the whole world, COVID and all of its challenges and all of that. Um, I mean, I want you to let us in on, on that period as well and getting him back, you know, um, into the ring, getting the confidence back and working with him during that period when the whole world had limitations and, you know, it just looked like sport was even not going to happen because of COVID. That was a, that was a, that was a trying time. It was a crazy time. And, you know, believe it or not, the world's still trying to recover from that period. You know, um, I, 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 I was born in the 60s, so I've been through the riots and, you know, after Martin Luther King's assassination, we've been through, you know, things like uh, the bomb and we were here when, uh, uh, when the Pentagon was uh, ran into with the airplanes and, you know, all this stuff, we had a chance to see all this. COVID was something different. It was, COVID was almost like uh, something out of the sci-fi channel. Uh, nobody never thought something like that could happen. And we was in this very gym when we got a call from the office telling us we had to shut down. We were actually supposed to fight at MGM. That was Thursday. We were supposed to fight at MGM that Saturday. 
So I got a call from PVC, you know, that the fight was on. And we were in limbo. Nobody knew what to do. You know, people, their, their jobs was on the line. Uh, was no currency coming going or going. And we had Isaac Dog Bay here along with other fighters. And in his case, we getting ready to fight. So we still got to find a way to train. They closed all the government. I mean, all the facilities, everything was shut down. We couldn't move. I mean, so nobody knew what was going on, man. And uh, we ended up uh, getting a call about this whole bubble situation. They don't put you in a bubble and, you know, then we, you know, fighting over the, you know, people don't want to get the immunization and you know, it was just crazy. Then you watching people that you know die and, and, you know, up to that point, we kept it, you know, we were safe. Mm -hmm. You know, we played by the rules. We did everything we needed to do, the masks, the gloves, the hand sanitizer. And then we ended up moving the gym outside on the football field. Wow. At one of the near uh, by high schools. And we had, uh, we had one of the coaches, Juice Gallon, he, you know, bought equipment down there. We made up, we had a heavy bag outside and, you know, we were sparring on the tennis courts. Uh, we did everything outside. And the guy went, next thing you know, we started seeing some of the football players, you know, NFL football players down there. Stephon Diggs was down there. Some of the NBA players was down there. So that was the gym. And lo and behold, I might go on the line and say this, that's some of the best shape we ever been in. Wow. It was Very hot. Tough. I mean, it was dead hot. The sun, there was no trees around. We were dead hot. You know, it took us all the way back to the motherland. Great. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because we children of the sun, and, and, and we felt it. And next thing you know, that was his first real training camp was outside wow. on Anacostia Field. Wow. Interesting stuff there. Big revelations being made here on uh, in camp with Isaac Dubé as we build up to Isaac Dubé versus... Uh, Rabai C. Ramirez. Let's zero in on the big day, um, April 1. Um, how has camp been so far? It's been good. You know, of course, we catching up. And again, whenever you start camp like that, whenever we start training for big, high-profile fights like that, it's ugly. You know, and, um, you know, nobody treats you nice. You know, there's times that you don't want to show up in the gym. We got to stay on his back. You know, and it's different, like, because I don't want him to be that guy that when you're hungry, you're working. I mean, but after you eat a little bit, your belly full, we don't work as hard, you know what I mean? So we want to stay that first guy. We want to yeah. continue on working hard. When he first came here, you know, Isaac, after we got over that, that first hurdle, he was one of them guys that, you know, you would have to stop him from training because he tried to do two, three times a day, you know, and you had to break him down, you know? Uh, and, and I told him recently, that guy, got back to the world title. I mean, that's the guy we want to keep. New guy, when you, you know, it's different when you start, you know, like I said, your belly full. Food is plentiful. You know, you don't work as hard no more. We don't want to get that. Mm. We don't want to be that guy. We want to stay that first guy, you know what I mean? And so we stay on him about that because we're only human, and I get it. Sometimes I got to throw myself out of bed to get to the gym. But nevertheless, if you're chasing that dream, you're chasing that goal, it's necessary. Coach, um, he's got hunger, definitely. He's got great work ethic. What about his opponent? What do you think about him? I don't think that, you know, based on what I've seen thus far, uh, I don't think he's great in one area. I think he's good in several areas. Um, do I think that this, this title gonna be easy? It's, ne it's never easy. The work you put in in the gym a lot of time can make it easier or harder. Um, so I'm not worried about that part. I know one of the guys he worked with, which is Larry Wade, which is a conditioning guy that works with us. We've been in the trenches together with Sean Porter. Uh, and of course, we've been in camp many times uh, in Vegas, in the mountains, so, you know, I, you know, pretty much, you know, kind of know what Larry's doing to him right now. Uh, I didn't see nothing special other than his confidence. 
you got a lot of confidence. Uh, and a lot of times, sometimes that confidence is good enough to take you over the top. I mean, um, he's an Olympian. If I'm not mistaken, he won the gold medal. But outside of that, that's about it. I mean, but it's our job to find whatever strengths and weaknesses he has. We want to exploit the weaknesses, stay away from the strength. Finally, um, what kind of fight are we going to see of your boy, Isaac Dugway, on April 1? Well, the thing is about Isaac, and I had this conversation with him, you know, Isaac is not just fighting for Isaac. Isaac is not just fighting for the headbanger boxing team or Boogie and I and Jamie and, and the coaches. Isaac is fighting for a country. I heard the cries from Ghana. I've seen the passion in the people's eyes and heard it in their voice about how bad they want that title back. I was a fan of Ike Quarte. I was a fan of Exuma Nelson. You know, uh, I have a, a very good friend of mine that happened to be my attorney and an agent in the NFL, as a matter of fact. And he loved you guys, president that passed away. Loved him. Rawlings. Loved him. Whichever the one, and you know, he would be able to tell me, but the one that said it was okay, in other words, y'all come on back home. You can be citizens of the United States, but we'll accept you back in Ghana too. You feel me? That one. And that was his hero. You know what I mean? And so, because of the history, it's, it's our mission, you know what I mean? To win that title and bring it back to Ghana. That's what I want. What's the thing that you said to him finally? Um, your last training session, the last word that you had with Isaac? I believe that was yesterday. And I said that very same thing. This is bigger than me and you. You know what I mean? And God resurrected him, you know, and I thank you guys for giving Boogie and I credit. But God resurrected him, brought him back from the abyss. Because like he said, he was in a dark place when we first saw him. Put him in our midst, gave us that mission to guide him back. And so this thing is bigger than me. It's bigger than Boogie. It's bigger than Ozzy. Wow. You know what I mean? I want him to be what God put him here to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, man. Well, so uh, you heard it from the man himself. Uh, you heard the story. You have heard um, what it's looking like now. And you know what a show is going to look like on April 1. Um, these exclusive conversations are here. And we sure are going to bring you some more as we look forward to April 1 in the ring in Oklahoma. Well, we'd like to say thank you once again Good to morning, Coach Barry morning. Hunter. And uh, we're going to be bringing you some more here on InCamp with Isaac Dobe. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Nathaniel Atto. And I have love for sport.